things are the right things to measure. Okay. Uh, so, um, for example, um, so here's here's a, a, a the, no, the, let me first say that there are many more things that one can actually measure. All right, than what I've talked about. One concern of uh, sociology literature and some economics literature is what does it mean to be central in a network, right? So we might imagine, for instance, a, a, a um, uh, say a, a, a school classroom and there is some kind of network in place which is the network of peer influence and um, students influence each other, right? So in studying for exams or something like that, if your friends are studying hard and working hard, you do the same and so on and so forth. Um, so one thing you might want to know is, 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 is who are the real opinion leaders? Who are the drivers here, right? So is this guy here in this network, for example, a central person, right? So there is a, 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 a large literature on this topic, okay? Um, and and um, it seems to me that, and that this literature is a bit misplaced because it, it doesn't answer, the, it, it says, we want to talk about centrality. So, well, obviously, if we, have, if we have people who are influenced, who influence nobody, they're not central, right? And, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and then they come up with measures. So a very popular measure is, 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 an, is, is an eigenvalue measure. So if we take a, a matrix like this, I mean, a, a, a rather a network like this, um, it has a social matrix, which is a non-negative square matrix. Um, it is, since this network is a connected network, that matrix is irreducible. Therefore, I'm sure that everyone in this room knows the Perot Frobenius theorem, right? Right, because it's taught in all economics PhD programs. So you all know this, right? And therefore, what it says, what, what people will say, and, and there's a guy named Phil Bonasich, who's made a life's career uh, in sociology doing this, is to say, take the Perot eigenvalue, uh, the Perot eigenvector. Take the eigenvector, so what does the Perot Frobenius theorem says? It says that if you have a non-negative irreducible matrix, it has its, its its, its characteristic value of largest modulus is in fact a real number, right? It is a positive real number. Uh, and the eigenvector associated with that, the eigenspace associated with that, is a one-dimensional eigenspace, okay? So then take the, take the, the vector, take a, take a vector that spans that space, that generates that space, okay? That is a strictly positive vector, okay? Um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I think it can, it can have zeros. Um, so it is a non-negative vector, right? But it, and it is not the zero vector, it's a non-negative vector, right? And the central guy is the guy who gets the largest weight, okay? Um, and, and, and so this is, this is a, a alleged to be a, uh, um, um, the weights of this vector, the, component, the uh, uh, components of this vector are alleged to be a measure of centrality. Well, what all of this leaves out is, well, what is centrality actually measuring? What does it mean to be central in a network? Okay, and um, <coughs> for example, if you build a game of social influence on a network, um, and there is such a game described in my notes, okay, um, uh, you'll see, right, that the appropriate measure of centrality is not the so-called centrality vector, but it's something else that actually Phil Bonasich wrote about in yet another paper. Um, because as I said, he has made a career of doing this. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, saying that there's some, here's a measure without any theory of why it is that this is the object to look at, right, is, um, um, uh, you know, is, uh, and that's not a actually a useful way to do science, I think. Uh, another question that somebody actually asked me at the beginning of uh, the break was, well, suppose that we're interested in talking about how quickly things are going to diffuse through <laughs> the network, right? Well, maybe we don't want to talk about, you know, you might think that looking at geodesics, that this is the way of measuring this, right? But maybe it's not the way of measuring it because things might go at different speeds or there might be more paths, even though there's, there's a longer path from A to, a short path from A to B, there's only one path where maybe they're all the paths from A to C are longer, right? But there's many, many of them, right? And so maybe it would be the case that things would diffuse faster, okay? 
Well, it turns out that there are things to measure for this. It turns out here that what you want to do is measure something called the conductance of the graph, and there's a large literature on this. Um, and I actually am excited by this particular concept because I have, um, um, uh, for a while, been, been, been thinking about, about, about uh, growth theory with Leontief production models. And you can think about a Leontief model as a graph that's describing a weighted graph, right? It's describing production flows, right? The flows of commodity um, uh, through a series of industries in order to produce final outputs. Um, and it turns out that if you want to ask the question, how long does it take your growth model to get near the turnpike, starting from an arbitrary initial condition, it turns out that measuring conductance of this weighted network is the right thing to do. Okay, um, and uh, so um, uh, in order to think about what to measure, you need to start with a problem. Okay, and the problem will tell you what to measure. Okay, uh, don't start with a measure and look for a problem. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, And don't start with an instrument either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I couldn't resist. Um, all right. Um, okay. I I am I want to talk about more than I usually talk about here. So I'm going to skip a lot of things here. I'm going to skip all this introductory stuff, and I'm going to talk about job search in labor markets. Right? How do people get jobs in labor markets? Well, um, <coughs> this is a uh, uh, here is a, uh, a a page from a paper by James Montgomery. James Montgomery is a guy who's had an interesting career. Um, he has a PhD in economics, I believe, from Northwestern. Is that right? Yes. And nonetheless, he chose to have a position in a sociology department. It's like saying, "Lower my wage." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> sociology department at the University of Wisconsin, which is one of the best sociology departments in the country, and he has a courtesy appointment in economics and um, um, has done some, uh, some very interesting work. Um, so this paper, you know, so here he is, he's a sociologist publishing in the AER, right, this comes from the AER, um, and this is, this is, is a, um, uh, kind of describes the number of studies that people have done to find out how it is that people who get into a new job, where did their job come from? How did they find their job? Now you'll notice uh, Myers and Schultz, this is, uh, this is a, a Chicago work, right? Uh, Albert Reese and, and, and Schultz. Mark Granovetter is a sociologist, okay? Um, and uh, uh, here we have, of course, the source of all good things, right? Uh, Mary Corcoran and the, uh, and the PSID. Um, so, uh, uh, you can see that this is a topic that, uh, that both economists and, um, um, and sociologists have looked at. And I think the thing to take away from this table, uh, you know, these were done at different periods of time, right? Different kinds of jobs, okay? This was done, this is a study of people that lived in a wealthy suburb of Boston, or at least an upper middle class, it's a wealthy suburb, a suburb of Boston called Newton. Um, uh, the PSID is all over the country, right? Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, what is striking about this is that uh, most people get jobs through friends and relatives, okay? Um, um, through connections, okay? Um, and um, uh, now Mark Granovetter uh, was the first person actually to alert the economics world to the fact that the structure of social networks might have something to do with how it is that people find jobs, okay? Um, and he wrote an article called The Strength of Weak Ties, right? Um, and he postulates it in social networks. I mean, actually, he's, he's, he's a subtle thinker on this. There is a continuum of, 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 of tie strength, but he imagines the following, that on the one hand, we have strong ties, like family ties, our very close friends, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, there are many people who are casual acquaintances, right? People who we see rather infrequently, who we, you know, maybe people we've gone to school with and, and we um, um, uh, get in touch with uh, only from time to time or something like that at the other end. Um, and, 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 um, uh, and, uh, uh, and these are weak ties. Uh, and what he says is that his, his thesis is that strong and weak ties 
play very different roles when you're searching for a job. Obviously, when you're looking for a job, you're going to contact everybody you know and say, you know, do you know of any jobs that might be appropriate for me? But what kinds of contacts do we think are going to be productive, right? Um, now, uh, and, and, and Granite Better is going to make an argument that weak ties in particular are productive um, and more productive than strong ties um, for two reasons, right? One reason is, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that strong ties, people to whom I have strong ties are people who are very much like me, right? And they're also all very much like each other, right? And that means that the amount of different information that I can get from sampling a group of small ties is not going to be that much. So if I ask five of my family, people in my family, about a, you know, do you know of any jobs, they're all liable to tell me about the same two jobs. I'm not getting a lot of different things. But if I ask, um, if I ask uh, uh, five acquaintances, right, um, I'm going to get, you know, they, these are all very different from each other, and then I'm going to get, you know, maybe some very different kinds of responses. Furthermore, because in fact, um, uh, you know, they are far from me, they're liable to sample into places that I am not getting into myself, right? So um, for all these different reasons, um, uh, Grand Vader argues that weak ties are, are productive. Now you'll notice here another example of what I like to call a pornographic definition, all right? This is another one of these things that I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, definitions, okay? You don't really know exactly what a weak tie is. And that leaves an open question as to how you might want to operationalize this in an empirical study, okay? Um, so let me talk a little bit, uh, a, a bit about, about why it is that weak ties matter, might matter. So here, imagine we have two cliques. We have, we have clique A and uh, 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 our bottom, oops, our bottom clique and our top clique, and I've distinguished nodes A and B. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in an edge between A and B, okay? Now this is actually, this, we're going to call this a bridge. This is actually pretty important because this, oops, this bridge, right, allows the transmission of information from this clique down to this clique, okay? So this link between A and B now becomes very important for everybody in the clique. So if this guy down here is looking for a job and this bridge exists, he might be able to find out about a job from here because this guy tells this guy. Now it spreads across to A who then tells his close buddy down here, right? Okay, um, so here's a, uh, uh, a slightly different situation. Um, now we can say that the, the A to B link has lost its, its distinguished status as being a bridge, okay, because um, uh, now there are in fact two different paths to get from clique, uh, the bottom clique up to the top clique. Um, but this situation, still these two clique uh, links in red are pretty important for channeling information. They're really the only two paths um, that can go from top to bottom, from bottom to top. We're going to call these things local bridges. Um, and they're local bridges because, because there are no, um, they don't link people who have common friends, OK? So this bridge right here between A and B, A and B have no friends in common. Here on this line here, we'll call this C and D. C and D have no friends in common. So we'll call this a local bridge. And again, these seem to be connecting with very, very different kinds of people, um, uh, very different parts of the social network. Um, so um, I now want to make a hypothesis. And that hypothesis is the following. I'm going to label, I'm going to label um, uh, every edge either strong or weak. Okay, Sometimes they're strong, sometimes they're weak. But I want, I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to make an assertion, okay, about um, uh, this. I'm going, to, I'm going to label according to, I'm going to have one rule for my label, uh, labeling, and that is that if I have a length two paths containing only strong edges, then in fact it's a triad, okay? <clears throat> if you're a close friend of mine, and you have someone else who is a close friend of yours, then it's likely that I at least am acquainted, right, with this person who's a close friend of yours. So at least there's a weak, and maybe it's even a strong connection between us. All right. So let's just take that as an axiom, okay, or an assumption for the moment, um, and 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 see where that so you can, takes us. You can see that our labeling here actually satisfies us: strong, strong, weak, right? Weak, uh, uh, that, that uh, strong, strong, strong. Okay. 
Now we also have some 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 weak things in the fact that there's a strong that this is that 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 this triangle is in fact uh, uh, open triangle here is in fact closed is not a does not follow from our assertion, um, uh, but um, uh, our uh, labeling here is in fact consistent with this principle of triadic closure. All right. So once I've done this, what's the implication of this? Oh, the implication of this is not on the slide. I have to actually look it up to tell you what the implication of this is. Um, and the implication of this is, um, hang on, let me get to my point here. Um, <coughs> the implication of this is that these local, that, that anything which is a local bridge, okay, this is the punchline here, um, that anything which is a local bridge has to be a weak tie, okay? If this was strong, right, then there would have to be a connection between D and A, okay? If this were strong, then there would be a connection between A and this point here, right? So what this says is that, is that our, 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 our idea of triadic closure, this triadic closure assumption implies that those links which are gonna be local bridges Right? They're going to carry us from one part of the network to another part of the network, right? Are very likely to be weak ties. And this illustrates this idea, this is just a, a thought experiment to illustrate why it is that weak ties might be very important because they take us to very different parts of the social network. Okay? And this is Grant Inventor's big idea. Okay? Um, so now what I want to do is I want to I want to I want to actually look at what Robinson did. So Grant Inventor, let me say that Grant Inventor did some very clever empirical work. He went out and he surveyed. Do I have that data here? Um, uh, we're not doing all that stuff. Don't worry. Uh, okay. Um, but maybe I have it in here. I, I want to say something about this. Um, Oh yeah, the other point that Grant had better read about weak ties was that was that weak ties are 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 you know weak ties are acquaintance acquaintances. It's not very hard to to um, uh, it's not very hard to uh, maintain weak ties, right? You call an acquaintance once every six months or once every year. It's not a big deal. But you know your 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 close friends are our relationships that you work at, right? Since weak ties don't require a lot of work, you can have more of them. Okay. Um, and so implicit in there is an assertion that we're weakly connected to many more people than we are strongly connected to. It doesn't seem that controversial. Um, so here's what Grant Inventor did. So he looked at, at, at people who recently changed jobs in the suburb of Newton, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston, um, uh, you know, a well-to-do suburb of Boston. And these are all people who have professional, managerial type jobs. And he asked those who found a new job through a contact how often they had seen the contact around the time that they were looking for a job, okay? And his idea is that, is that the frequency with which I see you is gonna be a measure of whether the tie is weak or strong, okay? Um, and um, he found that um, when asked where your, um, uh, um, how often you saw the, in, the informant who gave you, the, who told you about the job, uh, the answer was 16%, um, 16%, uh, actually 17% um, uh, of the people said, oh, I, I, I see this person often. 56% said, I see them only occasionally. And 26% said, I see them rarely. So by far, right, most of the referrals are coming from people who were seen only occasionally or rarely, but not people often but not often by the people who were looking for a job. Now, Grant Inventor actually asked them another question as well. He said, um, where did your informant get the job info from? Did he know it himself? Did he get, was it a job opening at his workplace? Or did he hear it from somebody else? In other words, what is the path length from the job to the informant? Okay, and 39.1% uh, uh, of the of the informants actually knew themselves of the job. They were the origin in some sense. Forty-five percent of them uh, had a, a the job was not. They heard about the job from someone else. 
right? That the job uh, originated, uh, uh, the path from the job to the informant was one step. For 12% of them, it was actually two steps, right? And then for the residual percent, it was actually more than two, right? So what's going on is that these weak ties are also kind of reaching far away, all right? Um, <coughs> and this is what Granite refers to as the strength of weak ties. Interestingly, there was a study done in 2005 um, using a survey of hires that was done in 1998 in uh, Russian metropolitan area um, that finds the same kind of thing, importance of weak ties. It seems to be a transnational phenomenon. Now, what I want to do is spend a couple of minutes talking about what are the implications of weak ties for inequality. What I want to do is I want to very quickly describe a model that Jim Robinson wrote. What's nice about this is this is a model that could have been a problem set in a class that I teach at Cornell. Okay? It's a very simple model, and yet, and, and, and that's, not, that's, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. It's a very simple model, and it illustrates a very powerful point. Okay, what could be better than this, right? This is what good science is, all right? And, 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 and uh, so what this, this does is, is it's, a, it's a simple model that illustrates some, some um, uh, income distribution implications of weak ties, okay? So here's how the model goes. Um, uh, I hope I can describe this in a quick fashion. We have workers who live for two periods, um, and the number of workers is the same in both periods. Workers are either high ability or low ability, half of the population is each, okay? Um, now, workers are observationally indistinguishable, which means you can't tell by looking at a worker whether he's, that worker is a high or low ability worker. Now, each firm is going to employ, the first period is going to employ one worker. And the profit the firm makes is going to be the employee productivity minus the wage, all right? So the, um, uh, 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 if uh, you are a high ability worker, you produce one. Um, where the firm's profit, the profit of the firm that hires you, is one minus the wage that it pays you. If you're a low ability worker, the firm's profit is going to be zero minus the wage that it pays you, which is likely to be a negative number, right? Um, and so that firm is going to be losing. We're going to assume that there's free entry, that entrepreneurs are risk neutral. Um, what is the equilibrium condition for a model like this have to be? Obviously, it has to be that in expectation, firms are going to be earning zero profit. So wage offers are going to equal expected productivity. Okay? So this is a world so far without social structure. Okay, then kind. All right, everybody with me? All right, so now I want to mess around with this. Actually, Jim Montgomery wants to mess around with this. Now let's suppose that um, uh, uh, that workers who are hired in type one, in period one know workers, other workers who are going to be hired in period two. Okay? All right, so now this is getting interesting. Um, and, and they may or may not know a worker, they know at most one worker. Okay? Uh, and the probability that a type, a, a period one worker has a social tie with a period two worker is this number tau. That's a parameter of our model. The likelihood that any worker has a social tie, that any period one worker has a social tie. Everybody understand? Okay. Now, um, what kind of tie is that? Okay. Is it a tie to somebody who's like you? Is it a tie to somebody who's different from you? Another parameter of the model, alpha, is the probability that you are tied, conditional on having a tie, it's the probability that you are tied to somebody who's like you. Okay. And now you can see the value of this because the firm who hires you in the first period is going to get to see your type, right? And if you know somebody, this could be useful to them, right? Okay. So, um, uh, okay. So we have these two parameters: this network density parameter tau. How likely is it that any person in the first period knows someone in the second period? If tau is near one, then there are lots of connections. And if tau is near zero, it's very small. And then this other parameter, alpha, which we'll call, which Montgomery called the inbreeding bias. How likely is it that the person you know is like you? Okay? And if, it's, if that number is one, okay, that means you know someone who has your characteristic. If it's one half, the lower bound, it means that it's a random person, that the fact that you have a tie um, is, is, is kind of useless. Okay. 
Um, so here's now the timing of the model. Firms hire period one workers through an anonymous market. market uh, uh, the market clears at some wage, okay? After that happens, social ties are assigned according to our, the probability rules that we have. And, um, okay, uh, and um, let me actually remind myself about what's going on here for a second. Um, okay, before we really, um, All right, so then what happens is uh, the social ties are assigned, and now um, the old generation of workers does its work, and they're going to retire, okay? Now, what, um, uh, what the firm can do, what the firm will do, is it will turn to its worker and say, do you know someone young for the next period? And if he says yes, all right, then that, um, that firm will say, tell your friend that I will hire him wage w, WRI, where I refers to the type of worker that you are, right? WR1 is the offer that the firm makes if his worker had turned out to be productive, and WR0 is the offer that the firm makes to the friend, right? If, uh, uh, if, if, the, if his worker had turned out to be unproductive, okay? Okay, so a wage offer is extended to the second period of friends, okay, um, uh, and, uh, and now the second period workers have to decide either to accept the offer or to enter an anonymous market, okay, and in anonymous market just like the first period, okay. Um, so if you enter the anonymous market, the only thing that the, that the firm knows about you is that you're in the anonymous market and that your characteristic is going to be, you know, and then, and then the firm is going to be able to figure out something about the distribution of types in the anonymous market. Um, and then the period two market is going to clear at some wage, which we'll call M2, the anonymous market wage, and then uh, for all intents and purposes, the model is over. Okay, does everybody understand? So, so I hire a worker, right? Um, that, uh, I see how that worker does. I then extend a wage offer to that worker's friend, depending upon how productive he was, and if he has a friend, of course. Right? Um, then these friends decide whether or not to accept my offer or enter the anonymous market. Okay. Then we figure out the market clearing wage for the anonymous market, and then we're done. All right, is that clear? This is really pretty. Okay. Um, so. Some obvious facts are going to be true in equilibrium. Well, only firms with good workers are going to make wage offers at all to the friends. If, if, if you were a bad worker, right, why would, I, why would I want to make an offer to your friend, right? So it's nice that the equilibrium actually says something obviously true. Okay. Um, uh, it turns out that the referral wage offers are distributed on an interval. That's not so important. Well, it is actually kind of important, um, um, uh, but we're not going to talk about that. The, Anonymous wage rate, right, in the first period, right, in the first period, what's the wage rate going to be? Remember, 50% of the workers are good workers, 50% of the workers are bad workers, so what's the wage rate going to be? Right, it's going to be expected, pro pro expected productivity, which is one half, 0.5, right? Okay. Notice in the second period, right, the anonymous market wage is going to be less than one half. Why is that? Anyone have a guess? Yeah, right, why? Right. The rest are, uh, who didn't have, who didn't have rubber offers, they have low productivity, and so the market don't want to offer high wages. All right, so, so that's essentially, I think what you said is essentially right, that the only people who get referral offers are good workers, yeah. right? Yeah. So, <coughs> assuming that offers are made that are going to be accepted, Okay, then, then the only people in the market are going to be good workers with no friends. Okay, and on the one hand, and then bad work, and then and then good workers with no friends, and well, actually, it was the only people who are going to be in the market are people who had no friends, right, or people who did, or people whose friend was a bad worker, 
okay? All right, and those people on average, right, people with no friends, that's like 50-50, right? But the people whose friends were bad are themselves more likely to be bad, right? Because alpha is going to be greater than half, right? And consequently, the composition of the anonymous marker is going to be biased more towards bad workers, and so the expected productivity has to be less than half. If I understand, there, there is a positive way to which the firm would be happy to offer the friend of the bad worker. It's just that the friend of the bad worker would never take that offer because they can do better. In the anonymous market. In market. the anonymous market. Yes. They're pulled in with the good right, and that's part of the equilibrium story that I'm not that I'm skipping over. But yes, that's right. That's why they don't make the offer because because any offer any offer that the firm would be willing to make, they would be willing to accept. Right. And it's precise, and you know the reason for that is precisely because there are some good workers in the anonymous pool. Yeah. Well, right. that right. Yes, that's right. So um, you want to take advantage of that. And furthermore, um, uh, the uh, what do we know now that we've got this social structure going? What do we know about what's going on um, uh, in the uh, in the first period market? In the first period market, right? I said without social structure, the expected wage was one half, right? But think about what happens now. When you hire a worker who's a good worker, what's the value of the good worker, right? The value of the good worker is the one unit you're going to get out of him today plus, right, the higher likelihood of getting a good worker tomorrow, right? So that worker is worth more than just merely his production, right? It's also worth, right, this, this referral, right, or the, or the possibility of the referral. So it turns out that once we introduce the social structure, right, the anonymous wage in the first period actually goes up, right? The first period market wage goes above one half, right? Because the bad workers are still worth zero, but the good workers are worth more than one half, okay? All right. Um, what are the comparative statics of this, right? As we increase alpha, we're making the friendship link more informative about type. As we increase tau, we're increasing the number of referrals. Okay? Right? We're increasing the density of the social network. What are the implications of that? The implications of that, notice, is that the second period anonymous market wage rate is going up, right? The is going down. The anonymous market wage rate of the first period is going up. And furthermore, the distribution of referral wages is actually moving forward, moving upward in a stochastically dominated way, which I, actually what's going on here is the top of that distribution is just moving up and the whole thing is sliding forward a little bit, okay? So what's actually happening is it's kind of in, um, uh, uh, if you're stuck in the bad market, if you're stuck in the anonymous market, your wage is going down. If you get a referral, your wage is in, is, is in some first order stochastic dominance and it's going up. Okay? So inequality is actually increasing, right? Because of the of the of the increased uh, utility to the firms of the network ties and the increased availability of network ties. Okay? So this is a nice example again about how this this sociological assumption about strong weak ties, right? Ends up having you know a substantive you know has something substantive to say in an economic model, right? About about things that are, that we economists care about. So I think that this is I mean this is a very simple paper, right? Uh, and uh, and 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 yet I, I think in some sense it's a nice prototype for what research like this should look like because you know it takes these 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 concepts which we use to describe social structure and it takes them into an economic model. And then draws out of it things that we care about, right? As as economists, as opposed, for example, as opposed to we economists trying to act like sociologists, right? And we can do that, right? Um, um, but what we're ultimately interested in is what does this have to say about economic phenomena? And here's a this is a very pretty a pretty example of that. Okay. Um, so I would encourage you to study this kind of paper. I mean, you know, it's, it's a nice example to see how a model is put together, right? How how the sociological hypothesis is brought in in a productive way, right? So this is a a a you know a thing that I think that uh, it's a nice exemplar, right? Um, uh, of course, today this paper was written back in the '90s, right? We now know more things. Uh, the literature has moved on, um, uh, but there's still interesting work to do. Uh, okay. Um, <coughs> all right, let me just get this. Um, I think I 
am going to skip all of this. Is a, this is a um, paper by Matt Jackson and 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 Vicky Calvo, um, Carmen Hall, uh, which was uh, on the reading list. And I was going to talk about this because it's a dynamic model of tide formation, uh, but I think I'm not because we are running out of time. And as you can see, it's a bit complicated, right? Um, okay. Um, so now let me move to um, another topic, pure effects and complementarities. And I have 45 minutes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk now about, about, about uh, the estimation of some social network models. Um, so again, I'm moving away from my comparative advantage and to yours <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and Chao Fu's. Um, so I'm, I'm good that Chao Fu's not here right now. All right. Uh, um, and I'm, and uh, how is it that, uh, that, um, uh, that here, I've listed here some different types of network effects. Um, uh, I've talked about social norms as being something distinct from, 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 from network effects, um, falling into, into some kind of larger social capital framework, I suppose. But social norms, in fact, um, the degree to which we can enforce social norms um, is, in fact, a consequence or caused in part by the social networks that we have. Okay, Because social norms are, are enforced by things such as the fact that we are stigmatized if we don't pay attention to the norm, if we deviate from the norm, the fact that we're rewarded if we act in a normative fashion, right? And, um, uh, and to the extent that we have social, lots of social ties, that makes this reinforcement stronger, uh, and so network structure actually matters, okay? Um, and uh, if one wanted to have a model of the raveling and unraveling of social norms, it seems to me that one might well start with a network model and ask how likely is it that a particular kind of social norm can be maintained depending on the network structure, okay? Um, and that is something um, when expressed, the game theoretic models that come to mind when I say that are things that have been worked on for a very long time, actually going back to the 1980s. Okay, and you'll find some references um, to that on the work on, on cooperation, gaming, and diffusion, starting with a paper of mine that appeared in, in, in Games and Economic Behavior in 1993. It's on the reading list, um, and, and Richard goes on. Um, uh, to 1980s, because actually we wrote the thing in 1988. Um, uh, but um, um, but um, when I, you know, so there's this abstract literature on cooperation, you know, on coordination games, on networks, and things like that. <coughs> but there's been very little done in actually interpreting that as models of social norms and using the insights from that literature to build you know, more accurate and, 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 and better models of, of, of creation and sustaining of social norms. So I think there are interesting research opportunities there. And so social norms, I think, are very much tied up with networks, even though I kind of poo pooed that earlier. Um, another, another kind of network effect um, is, uh, is, is uh, network externalities. Uh, and, uh, uh, and these, you know, these have to do with things that are essentially coordination games. Um, uh, uh, information and social learning. Uh, there's been some very interesting empirical work, um, as well as theoretical work, done on social learning. So imagine, for example, um, uh, there's, a, there's a very nice paper by, by um, Tim Conley, and I can see him, but I'm blanking on his name. I'm over 60, I'm allowed to forget names. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 Chris, Chris Udry, right? Udry and Conley, Conley and Udry. Um, on uh, the diffusion of uh, farming a new variety of pineapple in Ghana, right? And the question is, who takes up the new variety, and um, uh, and who takes up the new variety, and um, uh, and where do they learn about it from, right? Uh, what do social networks have to do with the diffusion of this new technology? And so this is, you can think about this as a kind of learning 
from your social network. Your neighbor plants the crop that comes out well. You say, okay, it looks good for my neighbor. I'll give it a try this year. Okay. Um, uh, there, uh, I have a friend who's a political scientist who studies who studies things related to to um, genomics and rice in India. Okay, and. Uh, um, He's a great believer in GMOs, is my friend. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, he was telling me about uh, some new variety of rice that's been introduced. It's been very productive. Farmers have adopted it. But now there seems to be a wave of disadoption going on, right? even though this thing is more productive. Again, this seems to be a social learning phenomenon of a particular kind. So learning on networks, learning by imitating one's neighbors, learning by observing the outcomes of one's neighbors, um, this is a very, a very interesting area for research. Um, the theoretical work is, is, there is some good theoretical work in place, but there's a number of interesting theoretical problems that remain. Um, uh, it's hard to think about how to do Bayesian learning in this framework. It's easy actually to write down Bayesian learning models. But Bayesian learning models actually require that people actually know the entire network structure so that when I see you doing something, I know how to interpret that, right? But what happened? Obviously, I might know, you know, I know you and I might know a few of your friends, but I don't know the whole social network out there, right? So we don't have, you know, good models that really talk about that. There's some ad hoc models and, and things like that, but there's a lot of interesting work to do in the area of information and social learning, which I'm not going to have time to talk about. Uh, but there is stuff in the notes on this some pretty detailed stuff in the notes, and so you should take a look at it. And you have until Friday afternoon to, uh, to grab me um, and get me to sit down and talk about it, and of course we can chat by email. Um, so here is a model. Um, uh, I'm now gonna talk about how one might estimate um, pure effects, okay, in a linear model. Um, now, so here's a model that uh, is, is, is kind of a common regression, okay. Um, uh, or at least related to lots of common regressions. And let me get to the right place in my notes here. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, so omega i is a choice variable for an individual. Um, and we're gonna, this is going to be a real value variable. Xi is a vector of individual correlates. Um, actually, I say that Xi is a vector of individual correlates. Xi is going to be one correlate because this is a lecture, right? <laughs> Easier to understand. We're going to have a vector of group averages of the correlates. And uh, we're going to have a vector of other group effects, yg. Um, and uh, then we're going to have some unobserved error term, okay? And, um, so it's alleged here that there is going to be, um, uh, um, so this is kind of a, 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 a regression. So the first person I know who, actually it's not the first person I know, people have run regressions like this since the, um, since the late 1970s. There's a paper by Wally, Wally Oates, right? Yes. Yes, that's right. And he actually, so for years, Stephen Dolph and I were going around saying the first person we know to run a regression like this was Lynn Thatcher. And, and then for some reason, I was reading, rereading some paper by, by Wally Oates that had to do something about public goods. And it turns out to be exactly this kind of thing. So it's a regression that's been around for a long time. Okay. And, um, um, and, uh, but a, a, a maybe a, an interesting paper to look at is this paper by Linda Datcher on effects on community and family background on achievement, which is in a review of economics and statistics. And, um, and so the, you know, the key idea here is that, is that um, characteristics of others have a direct impact on you. So if we think about this as you know, some kind of classroom setting, for example, um, uh, um, you know, this might be my own family income. This is going to be the income of the classroom average, say classroom average income, classroom average family income. This might be something, if we think about G as being the classroom, so people belong to groups, the groups are classrooms. This might be a teacher quality variable of some kind. You know, maybe we'll be fortunate enough to have observed it. There are data sets for that, a few, I think, where that has been possible, but not very many. And then we have the usual unobservable stuff. Uh, uh, now, um, so where does, where does a model like this actually come from, right? 
So, you know, review of economic statistics, you don't need a model. You just kind of write down an equation and estimate. That's kind of that. You can jump on me anytime here. You want opinions? I'll give you opinions. Okay. Uh, um, uh, so here's a model um, uh, that actually suggests where, 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 where something like this might come from. And this is referred to as, uh, as the linear and means model. Uh, and the first person I know to write this model down carefully um, was Chuck Bansky in a paper in 1995, I think, right? Um, in the review of economic studies, and the, and the leap between statistics and studies is huge. Um, so, uh, uh, and in this model, so how does this model actually work? He says uh, uh, the following, that um, in this model, we, so this is actually an equilibrium model, right? So I want to point this out. This is really an equilibrium model here. We have two behavioral equations, uh, and then we have an equilibrium condition. So what is the, the first behavioral equation is that um, the action of person I is a function, right, of, um, excuse me, of uh, his own correlate, um, some kind of group variable, okay, uh, and his expectation, okay, of what others are doing, okay, his expectations of others, the, this is I's expectations of the average behavior of all the other omega j's, okay? So this is a peer effect. The fact that you are studying hard makes me study hard, okay? Um, this is family income of the group. This is family income of the individual, okay? Um, now we have a, I, I call this a behavioral equation. It's not really a, it's just, it's not a behavioral equation per se, but um, it is a part of the behavior, specification of the behavioral relationships because it says that the group average, the, the group variable is in fact the average of the individual characteristic. And then finally we have the equilibrium condition that says that everybody's expectations are correct in the sense that the expectations that they hold for the behavior, average behavior of others are those that come out of the model itself, okay? All right, so it, it has a game theoretic feel to it, doesn't it? Okay, I haven't written down anything with best responses or anything like that, but if this were a best response function, right, then this really would be an equilibrium condition, a Nash, or a base Nash equilibrium condition, something like, or we could interpret it that way. Now this model has a reduced form, okay, and, and, and you can look at the reduced form, and the key thing to notice about the reduced form is that if I, I can't distinguish in the reduced form, right, the group effect, the effect of the group average here and the peer effect. So Mansky uses the word contextual effect, right, for this to refer, this, for, for this XG. He says that this is a contextual effect and this is a peer effect and you can't distinguish the contextual and peer effect. Yes? I mean, you're miss, missing something where there's a missing summation sign. Yes, there is a missing summation sign. Yes, yeah, that is a, you, you, you all can see, but it's, it's a very thin, white sigma. <laughs> very thin and white, okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's it, so we're sum, this is the group average, so obviously we're summing over everybody in the group. Okay. Um, by the way, a better way to do this model, of course, it's, it's odd to have your average, your behavior in here is one of the things that you're averaging, right? This is the model that Mansky actually wrote down, but you get the same story and all that if you do the slightly better thing, which is take the average of others, okay? Um, uh, and, and, and there is empirical work I've seen um, that actually is careful about that. And it has implications for identification, by the way. So in any event, um, here we have, the point is, is that we can't distinguish these two effects. Now, why can't we distinguish these two effects? Well, how is this, how is an xj going to affect me, my omega i? Well, there are two channels by which it can affect me, okay? One is the direct channel that xj, right, has an impact on it, affects xg, and that has a direct impact on my behavior, right? The other effect is the equilibrium effect that xj has a direct effect upon person j, right, and that, right, um, in equilibrium has an effect on my expectation about the group average, and so that's a second channel, right? And consequently, I can't separate these two channels in the reduced form, okay? So, um, uh, and so therefore, Mansky says, okay, 
This whole literature is cooked. Okay, <laughs> you're done. All right, can't you can't do any of this this this, this group stuff or the social network stuff anymore. Okay, and 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 and, and you're laughing because you know Chuck. If anything, Chuck is a man of extremes. And uh, so uh, he got. I, I saw him present this back in '95, and he had this ear-to-ear -ear grin. And he said, "You can't do this. He said, all this literature is meaningless." And he's just so happy. Okay. Um, gosh, this is being recorded. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> so um, here I've written down kind of a more general version of the same model, um, and the point I want to make is that this is a particular instance of a model that if you're old enough, you actually studied in econometrics, but if you're young enough, you've never seen, right? Uh, <laughs> right? So this is just the general linear model, right, that some of us cut our teeth on back in, in, in first year graduate econometrics. Um, um, and, and, and this is where, this is where, for instance, I learned about identification and regular order conditions and things like that. These days, I think you're just as likely to see discussions of treatment effects and, and other kinds of things, and uh, um, uh, this is what all the 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 the. the uh, I would encourage everybody who's interested in doing empirical work, and this is my particular bias, by the way, and so don't don't get too hung up with this. But I think that one of the one of the uh, the great economics texts of all time it's not a text, the great economics monographs of all time is the Hood and Coupons volume on identification. It was published by the Cowles Commission in 1953. Um, and there are some wonderful papers in there by Herb Simon and by Jacob Marshak that actually talk about what, ident what it means to have a structural model. Um, and, and it was those guys who actually talked about identification and sorted out the so-called rank and order conditions back in the day, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and those papers are fun to read. So uh, it's also, by the way, it's, it's interesting what you can do when you won't use matrices. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so the model that we would like to identify, the model that Mansky says that we have a problem with estimating, is in fact an instance of the general linear model. And 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 so I, I so the question is, is there a way of actually doing something so that we can identify this model after all? Right? Are there? So Mansky's calculations are entirely correct. And if that's the model that we have. Right, that everything is group averages, right? Then there isn't really very much that we can do, right? But um, uh, perhaps if we have other kinds of network models, we can go forward. And so the question is, what kind of conditions might, what kind of parameter restrictions might in on, on the parameters here, which I will interpret in just a second, in order to um, uh, be able to identify peer and contextual effects. Okay. Now, now notice what I've done here. Uh, this is no longer an average. So we, we have floating around here two social matrices. Okay. So um, uh, AIJ is a coefficient that measures the effect of J's influence of the influ of J's pure influence on person I. And we might think of that as being as, so this is a big matrix A, which is a social matrix. Okay. <coughs> we have another uh, matrix for effects, and this is how individual J's family effect, say family income, affects directly affects my outcome, right? So uh, uh, now these were the same networks, right? This was uh, one over n, and this was one over n. Each of these terms in Mansky's model. Um, now these actually might not be the same, right? It, it, it might be, for example, that Imagine being in a classroom and family income matters, or a person's family income matters because families make public goods contributions to the classroom. If you ask any fourth grade teacher, they will tell you that, right? <laughs> or not in your families, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, people donate time, people, people might donate money. Um, uh, I, I sent my kids to school in Israel for a year and the parents had to chip in to buy a heater, right, uh, uh, for the room. Uh, for the winter, <laughs> and uh, um, still there actually. I went and checked last time I was in Israel. My contribution to that classroom. So, so, so. But on the other hand, so there's a you know. So everybody in the classroom chipped in to buy this thing. It's called the Moscon. It's a combination heater, air conditioner. We all chipped in. But my kids were not friends with everybody in their classrooms. Right? They're only friends with some of those kids. Right? So those peer effects. So the 
that, you know, my, my daughter studied with some, a couple of kids all the time, and this is how she learned the local language when she was living. That was the pure effect, but she didn't study with everybody. But on the other hand, the contribution that everybody made contributed to her warmth and therefore her productivity in the classroom. Those were different, different social matrices, okay? So it's not stupid to think about having different social matrices. Now you might think this is gonna actually make life even worse, and so let's talk about what happens. Um, now, um, so what I want to ask is, well, so I've already interpreted these, oops, these parameters for you. Um, what kinds of restrictions on these coefficients are going to be reasonable, and how do they lead to identification? That's the question I want to ask. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, uh, how many of you know and love game theory? That's what I thought. Labor economists, all of you. Right? <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> so I love game theory. And I know some game theory. Um, and this is not a very hard game that I'm going to describe. Um, but at the end of the day, what I would like to do with the model is I would like to, to be able to estimate a model like that. And then I would, be able, I would like to be able to make poli policy prescriptions on the order of what kinds of network interventions, what kinds of subsidies, and to whom would actually improve educational outcomes, for instance, or improve utility. Um, <coughs> and, um, and therefore, if I want to make welfare statements, which is what we often want to do in policy analysis, we need to have utility functions running around somewhere. Okay? And so I've now written down a utility function, I've written down a game, which is going to embody the social interaction. Okay? And let's see what that looks like. We're going to have individuals described by a type vector. Um, there's a publicly observable type, so I can observe the, every individual in the classroom can observe, so we're not talking about fourth graders now, uh, can observe family income of everybody in the classroom. So the correlates, uh, the, 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 the correlates, the, the x's um, uh, are all observable to ev everybody in the classroom. Everybody also has a private type, okay? Something that might be ability or something like that that is really only observable to that person, okay? And not surprisingly, this is going to connect up to the unobservables in some way. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> you, you've all had a year of micro theory, right? right? And therefore, you've all seen Bayesian games. You know, you might not love them. Something's wrong with you if you don't, by the way. But you might not love them, okay? <laughs> but you have seen them, okay? And so you know that there is this thing called the common prior, called the Harsani prior. Right, that describes the distribution of types. And we have one here. Okay. Actions are going to be these things omega i in R, and we have payoff functions. So let's look at this payoff function. Okay. Um, what, uh, um, and I wonder if this actually looks better on the next slide. Yes, okay. So the way to think about this is that, is that there is a, um, uh, a private utility that I get. Okay from choosing my type omega i. If, I, if, if there was no social, nothing social going on, okay, then I would just want to maximize this, right? And what I would do is I would set omega equal to theta i, and I'd be done, right? But then there's also the social thing going on. And phi is going to measure the strength of the social thing. So what is going on here with the social thing? These aij weights are going to be the, the sum over all of the j's is going to be equal to 1. So we can think about these as probability weights uh, or normalized weights in some way. And this then is, in some sense, the average, the average of my average of what my, my influence weighted average of what everybody else is doing. Okay? Um, clearly, some people are closer to me than others, perhaps. And so now what I want to do is I want to minimize the square deviation. Right? I want to minimize the square deviation of what I do from my friends. Okay? The strength of that effect is measured by phi. Okay? Um, now, let's go one step farther and let's unpack what theta i is. Theta i is what I would choose on my own. Right? And that is going to be a function right, of my own characteristics and the direct effect of others and my private types. Okay? So that's the model. All right. Um, and uh, and again here, this is my averaging of the of the direct of the characteristics of others, right? Um, uh, and I through the so-called contextual effects network. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, so you can you can solve for the equilibrium of this model. Equilibrium of this model is unique. It's really easy to solve. Okay. That's good news. 
Okay. Um, uh, actually, let's put it on an undergraduate final exam. Um, a little bit less complicated. <laughs> <laughs> My undergraduates are good. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and you get out at the end of the day an equation that looks like this. Okay. So let's remember that gamma is your own effect, right? The effect of your own characteristic. Delta is the importance of the average characteristics of others, and C. Um, each row of C, the i row of C, describes how person I averages the direct effects of others. Um, and when I think about this, by the way, I do think of classrooms, and I think of this as kind of a local public goods thing. So C really is just averaging everything else. Okay. Now, in all these, by the way, these are these are adjacency weighted adjacency matrices. So I do suppose that that the diagonals are all zero. Okay. So that that that. My own public good, my own contribution to the public good is kind of wrapped up in gamma. Okay? Everybody else's contribution to the public good is wrapped up in delta and C. Okay. Um, and you'll notice again that this is a model that's of the general linear form, and we have these constraints which are imposed by the theory. Okay? Um, and um, uh, so and in fact we have all of these constraints that are imposed by the theory. Now the common model, which is, which is estimated, assumes that the pure and the contextual effects matrices are the same. They assume that A and C are the same matrix. Okay? And if you assume that, you get even more constraints on the model. Okay? Now, um, all right, so now I built a theoretical model. Um, uh, it's given me the, you know, the, 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 the statistical model that we regress. Okay? Um, I have not described everything that's going on because this omega thing, this eta thing, for instance, is quite interesting, and there's interesting game theory in here, but we won't talk about that um, now. And um, uh, but we've gotten down to a, a a general linear model with some constraints that are imposed by a theoretical structure, right? And now the question is, what do we know? Does, does this theoretical structure help us with identification? Okay. Now, what I would say, in, in, uh, this is that it, it, if you think about this, suppose that A and C were known. If A and C were known, okay, this is basically a this is only a three-parameter model, okay, and it's going to take very weird versions of A and C in order to not be able to identify the parameters phi, gamma, and delta, which are the utility parameters. It would be, now it so happens in the case that Chuck Mansky considered in the reflection paper, okay, it turns out to be precisely the only case where you can't identify the utility parameters if you know the matrices A and C. Okay? So that's kind of a remarkable fact, right? That, that you know, you, you draw the, the kind of, you write down the kind of the natural first model that comes to your mind, you write it down, you analyze it, and it's the only case where things go screwy. Okay, but so it goes. Okay, um, and 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 uh, so that's one thing. Now, but um, another thing that I would like to think about is I can imagine circumstances where I might know. See, I might be willing to hypothesize that these are public goods, and I like this local public good model where we just average everything. But I would also want to think about what happens if I don't know A at all. Suppose that I don't know anything about the social matrix except for the fact. Or I suppose I know very little about the social matrix, except for the fact that, um, you know, beyond the fact that it's got zeros on the diagonals. Well, one can actually show, right, that, that, that for uh, generic A, right, the utility parameters, well, actually what's true, let me be precise about this, for, for as long as gamma plus delta doesn't sum to one, it will turn out, and I'm not going to prove this, and I'm not even going to, I don't even have a slide that states this. It turns out that you can identify the parameter, the, the elements of the matrix A and the utility parameters. <coughs> that's um, um, that's kind of a that's kind of a surprising fact, I think. And I think that that's really striking because it suggests that one can actually deploy methodologies like this even when one doesn't know the social matrix. And I think that it is ridiculous to think that we actually know these social, social matrices in many cases where we want to deploy the linear model, where we want to use the linear model, okay? Um, but what I want to talk about is something else, okay? Um, suppose we don't know anything at all. Suppose we know very little, okay? 
Um, how much do we need to know about, about A and C if we didn't know it? So let's imagine that, that, that we don't know anything about the num We know very little about the numbers of A. We know very little about the numbers of C. In fact, suppose the only thing we know are where zeros are in the matrix. Okay. So I want to think about exclusion restrictions, right? In the in the linear model, I want to know. I want to suppose it is the case that I know that you and I are not connected. Okay. Um, how much, right, of that? What do, what needs to be true about the network if we only know this qualitative structure about where the holes in the network are? What under what conditions will the um, uh, will will the utility parameters be identified? Um, and what else can be identified under those circumstances? And here's a long theorem. I'm not going to bother to read it. Okay. But what I want to say is that what you can do is just apply the classical rank and order conditions, right? And the classical rank conditions tells you that if you've got enough holes in any one equation, right, in that system, right, um, <coughs> then the utility parameters will be identified. Okay. Now, as you know, that there are there are you know there are rank and order there are there's a rank condition which is necessary and sufficient for identifying a single equation in the in the model. There's also a, a rank condition which is necessary and sufficient for identifying all the equations, all the parameters in the model. And one can actually use the, one can one can mess around with these kinds of things to talk about identifying characteristics of the of the of the C matrix and the A matrix if one wanted to. And I think that one might want to talk. The problem is it's hard to imagine data sets where you would actually be able to estimate the so, the the, um, the social matrices, even if you could estimate the utility parameters. So the idea that I have in mind for estimating the utility parameters that I might observe a lot of different classrooms, each with its own own set of matrices. Okay. Um, now, one can show that if you've got a, a lot of, 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 of classrooms like that. The utility parameters are identified, okay? And furthermore, you can even construct a consistent estimator of the utility parameters, okay, when you don't know the social matrices so long as every classroom satisfies this condition for some individual in that classroom, okay? Um, uh, now, I suppose it's true that if you have repeated observations on any one classroom, you could identify the matrix A and the matrix C, but I don't think that's a particularly interesting thing to do. But if you know the utility parameters, because you assume that the utility parameters are the same across classrooms, then, in fact, you can construct welfare bounds on policies that, in fact, you might be able, you might want to, you know, try out in some of these things. So you can get welfare bounds from the utility classroom, from, sorry, from the utility I'm talking to, classroom the utility parameters, even if you don't know, right, the social matrices. And so the point of doing this, right, is to say that, that there is now this thing out there that people say, well, you can't estimate these linear models because Chuck Mansky said so, okay? And you know what? That's just wrong, all right? Um, so that's kind of one take home, that you actually can estimate these models. Um, and we can estimate a richer class of models than that which people have already thought about, okay? A second thing is, and this is the thing that I liked, ad health asked the wrong question. Now, how many of you know what ad health is? You know what ad health is, and no one else does. So there's a, 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 a big data set out there which seems to be the go-to data set for empirical work on social networks, and it's called the National Longitudinal Survey of Adolescent Youth. It's abbreviated ad health. And what they did was they asked people to list, what, up to five friends or something like this. I don't remember the details, okay? Uh, and 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 then and so now we have some hints as to what the social network looked like because they asked people they, they surveyed people in schools right so what does your you know what is your who are your friends okay so I think that they actually asked the wrong question instead of saying who are your friends they should have said whom don't you know right they should have asked for exclusion restrictions right? <laughs> but that's isn't that exactly right uh, and, and you're not you're skeptical. <laughs> in a sense, they, they measure the exclusion restrictions of the error, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. And, and people make a big point out of saying that, you know, that although there is an upper bound, that many, many of the people's students didn't hit the upper bound. So you can presume that we've actually, and, and that seems to me a little bit surprising. 
um, because that upper bound was pretty small. And actually, oftentimes what we're interested in here is not, you know, there, there's a question about, you know, when, is, when we ask, you know, who are your friends or who are you affiliated with, every one of us in the room might interpret that in a different way, right? And, 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 and so, you know, maybe there's a bunch of people out there and they're not your friends, but you pay attention to what they're doing, you know, and that has some influence on you. And that's going to be important in this model, right? So we are, we are estimating, we are, we are getting all of these things to give error. That's right, and that's an interesting thing to think about. All right, so this is all I wanted to say about this kind of empirical work. This kind of empirical work is done. Um, I would, you know, it, it might it might well have been a smart thing to do to spend the whole three hours talking about estimating models like this. Um, but I actually wanted to talk about more ground than that. And 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 what I'm really trying to do here is to sell you on reading things. Okay, I don't think that there's much that I can actually teach you standing in front of you for three hours, but what I can maybe do is whet your appetite, get you interested enough to go and read on your own, and you'll find all the references for this um, in the notes, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, other things that one might do, okay? There are other things, you know, all of these models that we, that we estimate, um, you know, the, the, as I said, the linear models that say that we average the effects of everybody around us, these are very popular models, okay? But they're not the only way in which pure effects might work. So this is a list that comes from a paper that Carolyn Hoxby wrote, okay? And these are her names, okay? Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and you have all read this by now, and you're all, you all can imagine instances of almost every one of these things. You have all been in the classroom with someone who is an amazing pain in the neck, right? and takes up all the teacher's time, right? <laughs> all right, we've been there. Now there's this, there's, there's, we've all been in a classroom with someone who we just admire, say, I want to, you know, I want to achieve like that person does, right? Well, I never was, but. <laughs> but many people were, right? Um, uh, here, here's me, okay? Uh, here's some guy who's doing really, really well. I can't beat that, screw it, you know? I'm, I could, all right? Uh, and, um, and I and, and and I don't really understand this boutique thing, uh, but um, uh, but Carolyn thinks there's a good case for it. Put her paper. So so this is another model that 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 uh, that, that maybe that uh, maybe what you, maybe what we're really trying to say here is that pure effects are stronger when their appears are really more like us in some way. Okay. Um, so the point is is that one can go back and play the same game that I played. That's a pun because what was my game? My game was to build. A Bayesian game, okay. But one can so one can go back and do the same kind of exercise with these different kinds of nonlinear models, right? And, and 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 look for pure effects. There's a lot of evidence out there that suggests that pure effects might look like, you know, the threshold phenomena might be important, right? That it's not just a linear world out there. Um, a uh, topic that's something that I want to think about in the near future. Is 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 non-parametric identification of these models um, because um, I don't really like having to commit to um, uh, exactly how the pure effects work, um, and uh, I think that there's reasons to believe. For I guess reasons that I would rather discuss afterwards. Um, uh, there's reasons to believe that uh, um, uh, that there are theoretical models that might be open to uh, a pure effects that might be open to non-parametric identification. And I wanted to suggest that these are topics that are that I think are, 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 are researchable and interesting. Uh, we're not going to talk about social capital. Uh, by the way, this is a guy in Budapest sweeping up pengos in 1947. Right? The world record inflation rate. Okay, ten times the inflation rate of the Weimar record inflation. Uh, that's a great picture. Okay. I, I have five minutes, and I'm, and I'm actually just flipping through this to see if there's anything that I want to say. Um, and there really is all kinds of things that I want to say. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but nothing that I have any time to say. Let me point out, I, I really want to encourage you to take a look at my notes and then, and then read some stuff on your own. And I think that this stuff about, about social learning um, uh, is, really, is, 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 is really very interesting, right? Um, uh, there is a lot of work on, on the fusion of technology and social from, through social networks, and a lot of this has to do with social learning. 
a lot of, many of the stories, some of the stories that have to do with supporting social norms, again, have to do with social learning. These models are actually easy to do, okay? Um, a lot of them look like simple Markov chain models. Um, uh, and there are some very interesting questions um, uh, uh, that one can, I, I think that this is stuff that can go to empirical work. Um, you know, in the, in the near term, in the same way that the linear social interaction model has gone to appear for. Um, and uh, uh, there's a, uh, um, a very nice paper, I think, by, uh, uh, by, by Buzz Brock and Stephen Durlop that um, talks about, about uh, implications of social networks for the shape of the fusion curves. And if you're in that business, right, you spend a lot of time estimating the fusion curves, right? Um, and Stephen and Buzz in their paper point out that in the presence of social networks, you know, the typical diffusion curves are kind of S-shaped, right? First, a few people start adopting a new technology, then it picks up rapidly, and then finally the tail comes along, right? And it's a S-shaped kind of thing. Stephen and Buzz point out that in the presence of social networks, there are very systematic deviations from the S-shaped story, and therefore, and this is an instance of what we talked about at the very beginning, that looking at this aggregate thing, this emergent property, so we have a system where everybody is learning from everybody else, right? The emergent property is the shape of the diffusion curve, right? And Durloff and Brock point out, right, that there is a systematic deviation from S-shaped diffusion curves, which can be attributed to social networks they want to go so far as to say that, that, the, that measuring in diffusion curves particular deviations from the S shape that we normally see is prima facie evidence of social learning, right? And so this is a very interesting thing to pursue. Um, and their paper is in the Journal of the European Economic Association. Yeah, the new European Economic Association Journal. Generally, that is. I get confused. Um, and I, so I would, I, if I had another hour, I would be talking about social learning. Okay, but I don't have another hour, so I'm going to stop. Thank you very much.